Hillsdale Presbyterian Church on this second Sunday of Easter. Some folk treat Easter as a one-day event, but one of the great things about Easter is that there are 50 days in the Easter season. It goes all the way to Pentecost, which means 50th. It refers to 50 days after the Passover when Jews celebrate the Festival of Weeks. And Christians celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit 50 days after the resurrection. So it is still Easter today. The season has just begun. So let's greet one another with the same words we used last Sunday. I say Christ is risen, and you respond, he is risen indeed. So here we go. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And we light this candle to remind us that Christ is here, right with us. Now, long, long ago, King David was in a rough spot. He was dealing with the stress and worry of attacks from enemies. And the day came when, after doing all he could to keep his people safe and secure, he realized that now he had to put his full trust in God. So he wrote a song of trust in God, which is Psalm 16. And during this COVID-19 pandemic time, we too are doing all we can, all we should, to protect ourselves and others from infection. And now the time has come for us to put our full trust in the God of life. So I invite you now to join me in this responsive call to worship from Psalm 16. I suggest that in the beginning you say to yourself, I've done all I can. I've done everything required of me. Now I place my trust in God. So say that to yourself and we will read this psalm responsively. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to show or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Let us unite our hearts in prayer. O God of resurrection power, yours is the glory. For you have conquered death and sin. Honor, glory, and praise be to you, our risen Savior. You have scattered our doom and gloom. Our despair is overcome by hope. Our fears are dissolved by your victory. Joy bubbles up within us like a spring of cool, clear water. We thank you, adore you, worship you. But even as words of praise fall from our lips, we confess that doubts creep into our minds. Sometimes we allow the cynics and the disbelievers to shake our confidence in you. We want to share our joy with others, but often we are ashamed to stand up and be counted as Christ's followers. Like Peter, we even deny him by our words and actions. Forgive us, O God, for the times in this past week when we have allowed a mean and critical attitude to dominate our behavior. 
Forgive the unbelief that keeps us from a free and generous sharing of the love of Christ with others. Forgive the times when we have ignored the promptings of your Spirit and have missed opportunities to say or do something for others. Hear our confession, O merciful God. Cleanse and renew us through the grace of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, here is good news. Just as Christ forgave the disciples who deserted and denied him, so he forgives us and gives us a new start. Thanks be to God for new beginnings. We are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. And now let us sing together what would be in our hymn book number 260, the song Alleluia, Alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. And we're singing just verses 1, 2, and 4. 1, 2, and 4. Now we come to our reading for the service today. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31, and our friend Richard will read it for us. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were, where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the the mark of the nails 
and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today, I want to talk about what happens behind closed doors. I have been behind closed doors, just as you have, for several weeks now. And we have been behind those closed doors for a much longer time than we have ever been before, because we have been told to stay the blazes home, to quote Premier McNeil of Nova Scotia. This is not easy. It's not normal. And most of the time, it's no fun. So today, I invite you to imagine that you are in a room much different from the one you are in right now. Imagine you are in the room where the disciples gathered after Jesus was killed. Imagine you are one of them. The room you are in is dark. The shutters are closed and the door is shut tight. You are behind that closed door with the friends and followers of Jesus. So, how are you feeling? Well, most of all, you are scared. Fear is what brought you here. You saw all too vividly how they tortured Jesus and hung him on a cross. Lord knows what they're going to do to you when they catch you. You fear that they will now be looking for his friends and you will be next. You fear for your life. You fear for your future. And mixed with your fear would be a dose of guilt. After all, you deserted Jesus in his hour of need. You ran away when he was arrested. He asked you to stay awake and pray for him, but you fell asleep. You failed him. And now you are ashamed of yourself. You carry a heavy burden of guilt. I suspect you're also feeling hopeless. You placed all your hope for a new world and a new life on Jesus of Nazareth, but now he's dead. And when he died, your hope died with him. And you might be feeling confused too. You have no idea what to do next. What does one do when one's whole reason for living has been smashed to pieces? And I expect you are feeling helpless and weak, too. You need strength to pick up the pieces and move on, but all your energy is drained right out of you. Grief does that for us. So there you are, you and the rest of his friends, behind closed doors, sitting in the darkness of closed shutters and destroyed dreams. You are feeling scared, guilty, hopeless, confused, helpless, and weak. Now let's leave that room and come back to the room that you are in today. It is likely a quiet place, shut off from the world, and the person or people in your room are not all that different from the people in that room long ago. We too come with our fears, what is it that you fear today? Is it fear of COVID-19, fear that you or one of your loved ones might catch it? 
Is it fear that you or a friend might lose their job? Is it fear of being cooped up in your home many more weeks, maybe even months? Are you afraid of loneliness and isolation? Are you afraid that the day will come when you just can't take it anymore? Fear, you know, is a prison. It locks us up behind closed doors. Fear makes us hide away from others, from the world, from God. So we come to this room with our fear. And we also come with our guilt. For we too have failed Jesus. We have not stood up for him in his time of suffering. We have not spoken out for his values when others ridicule the values of peace and justice and love. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. So we come to this room with our burden of guilt. And what about our feelings of hopelessness? Do we doubt that God and good will one day triumph over the powers of evil? And are we too doubtful and worried and scared that we will never get through this COVID-19 crisis? And besides our hopelessness, we are probably confused about where to turn and what to do next. And we bring our sense of helplessness and weakness. Sometimes we're just too tired and don't have the strength to go on. So this room you are in is not all that different from the room with the locked doors. So what happens behind closed doors? What happens is this. Into that fortress of fear, that scene of shame and guilt and hopelessness and confusion, comes the gentle, wounded shepherd. He comes quietly. He doesn't break down doors. He who bursts from the tomb has no need to break down doors or even to knock. Even if he did knock, would that timid, fear-filled group open the door? Knock, knock. Who's there? It's Jesus. Yeah, right. Bolt that door, Peter. So he just comes gently into that room. And you know, he starts to hand out gifts that they need. His first gift is a word of peace. Peace be with you. Shalom be with you. Wholeness be with you. And that word of peace is the gift that takes away both their fear and their guilt. He doesn't tear a strip off of them. He doesn't judge them. He doesn't dump a load of guilt on them. He offers them his peace. Peace that calms their fears. Peace that forgives all their failures. So what happens behind closed doors? The gift of peace is given. And at the same time, that dark room begins to light up with hope as it dawns on them that Jesus really is alive, that death is defeated, their hope is rekindled. He shows them the mark of the, the nails and the spear, and they know for sure it is the Lord. They cannot contain their joy. Everyone tries to talk at one, high fives all around. The light of hope has flooded that room. And behind closed doors, the gift of hope is given. And after the excitement and laughter die down, Jesus says to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. Note he repeats the word of peace. His first word of peace forgave their failures and banished their fears. His second word of peace answers their unspoken question, What's next? What do we do now? Well, the answer is loud and clear. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. But what does that mean? The people in that room know all too well what it means. 
It means that Jesus was sent by the Father to do not what he wanted to do, but what the Father wanted him to do. He was under orders. I've come to do the will of my Father, he said. His job was to obey no matter what it cost, and it cost him his life. And he passed this on to his followers, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and live in his love, so you will live in my love if you keep my commandments. That is, I am here to obey and so are you. And now behind those closed doors he is telling them that the game plan has not changed. The game's not over. That nasty cross stuff was only the second period. Now we go into the third period and your job is to play the way the Father tells you. So that gift takes care of their confusion. Behind closed doors, the gift of clear purpose is given. But hold on for a minute. That gift raises a bigger problem for the disciples. It is this. If our job is to do what you did, to go out and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, if our job is to tell everybody that you are the promised redeemer, then that's pretty risky business. I mean, man, they just hung you on a cross three days ago. They carry a big stick. They've got all the authority of religion and all the power of Rome behind them. If we are going to obey you, we can't do that alone. We need help. We need lots of help. And what did Jesus do to solve the problem of helplessness? Well, it says he breathed on them. Now that's not a very polite thing to do at any time. But in these days, it is a downright deadly dangerous thing to do and you could be thrown in jail for doing it. If we go around breathing on people, we could find ourselves in pretty deep trouble. But why did Jesus breathe on them? Because he knew they would get the connection between his breath and the next words, receive the Holy Spirit. What's the connection? In Greek, the word for spirit is pneuma. You've heard that somewhere before. Pneumatic, tires, air. Pneuma means breath, wind, spirit. In Hebrew, the word is ruach. Sounds like our Scottish friend Tom Lang clearing his throat. It also means breath, wind. Spirit. In Genesis, this word ruach is used when God breathed the breath of life into the first human beings. And when the Spirit moved upon the waters, it was the ruach, the wind, the breath of God. And in this room behind closed doors, Jesus breathes new life, new strength, new power into these weak, helpless disciples. And behind closed doors, the gift of the Spirit is given. What goes on behind closed doors? Gifts are handed out. Gifts that turn a defeated people into an Easter people. But some people, they miss out on the gifts because they're not there. And that's what happened to Thomas. Poor Tom. He broke isolation and was out buying bread or something. I mean, somebody had to go get the groceries, right? So he missed out on the gifts. But not to worry. Jesus knew he was absent. Ha! Did you know Jesus keeps attendance? He knew Tom wasn't there. So he came again a week later and he made sure Tom got his share of the gifts. Tom needed a little convincing but he came around once he knew it was his living Lord. We too are Thomas, you know. We were absent. We were not there on that day when they crucified our Lord. And we were not there on that first Easter evening when he spoke peace and breathed the Spirit into them. 
We were not there a week later when he came to see Thomas. We were not there the second Sunday of Easter, but we are here on this second Sunday of this Easter. We were not there behind those closed doors, but we are here behind our closed doors. Just as Jesus took that room full of scared, hopeless, helpless, failed followers and turned them into an Easter people, so he takes you and me and with all our fear and anxiety, with all our guilt and shame, with all our despair and hopelessness, with all our weakness and helplessness, and turns us into a joy-filled Easter people. What happens behind closed doors? Why, Jesus hands out gifts, that's what. He does it every Sunday, don't miss it. And right now, behind your closed doors, whatever your worries or fears or concerns in this terribly difficult time, know this. Jesus is reaching out to you with the gifts that will lift you into hope and peace and Easter joy. So reach out to him. Receive his gifts. And then reach out to those around you and share God's love with them. And God bless you, my Easter friends. Friends, while we are unable to respond to the good news of the gospel by placing our offering in the plates, as we usually do, we can offer our gifts to God in other ways. Our church members can give their gifts through checks sent to the church and through the pre-authorized remittance program, but there are other ways to show our thanks to God. And that is by giving the gift of kindness and love and encouragement and support to those in need of a friendly call or an email. And we can send extra gifts to organizations that are working full out to protect the most vulnerable in our society, like First United Mission, or the United Gospel Mission, or the Salvation Army. So with a generous heart, let us praise God in the words of this doxology. intercession on behalf of others and if you have particular people or concerns that you want uh, mentioned in the uh, prayers in upcoming weeks we hope you will send those to us and let us know but for today we will uh, have a couple of moments of silence in the middle of the prayer when you can lift up those concerns to God so let us pray together O oh God of new life the risen Christ came speaking words of peace and hope. Thank you for opening the closed doors of our hearts, the closed doors of our faith. Thank you for strengthening our faith and empowering us to live with hope and trust in you day by day. We are grateful that you give us courage to face our fears and struggles and patience to endure moments when the way ahead is not clear. Loving God, we pray for the many places of brokenness in our world. We think especially of those suffering in the COVID-19 outbreak, those with the disease, those who have lost loved ones, those who have lost work or lost hope, those healthcare workers who, even while fearing for their lives, continue in silent courage to care for the sick. In these moments of quiet, 
we name the situations on our hearts today, all those places in need of your healing help. God, we ask that the whole earth will experience your gift of new life and hope. And we pray for this congregation and all those who are watching and listening. We pray for our Presbyterian Church in Canada and for the Church of Jesus Christ in every country and culture. In these days of unexpected challenge, when worship and fellowship have been disrupted, strengthen our trust in you and our concern for others. Make us good stewards of this time apart to reflect on your presence with your people in these difficult times. Help us maintain the joy we know in the risen Christ. Help us to become the means of opening doors of hope and peace for struggling neighbors. We also pray for ourselves, our family, and our friends our neighborhoods and our community. And we especially remember to today Wilma Lane, a dear, long-time, wonderful member of our community. Her daughter writes that she is declining quickly and nearing that time when she will graduate into the presence of her loving Lord. We pray for daughter Carla, Carla and all her loved ones who are not able to hold Wilna's hand or give her a hug and only can visit through a window. Bless them with your strength, with your confidence that there is life, new life, eternal life because of the resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ. And now we lay before you in silence others, the ones that we particularly are concerned about and who are on our hearts and minds today. We are grateful, dear Lord, that we can place all our worries and hopes into your hands, knowing that you will hear us and respond. So hear us now as we offer the words of our risen Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, let us sing our Easter joy with this hymn. It would be 757 in the hymn book if you have one. Come sing, O church, in joy. We are singing verses 1, 2, and 3.
Hear this blessing in the words of Jesus. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. And as you go, or more likely as you stay, may the blessing of God the Father, the peace of God the risen Son, and the strength of God the Spirit be with you and all those whom you love. We leave you now with the glorious strains of Beethoven's Ode to Joy with Bernard Dirksen on the organ.